All right, welcome back to uh, the next video in our pre-calculus series uh, during this distance learning environment. Uh, today we're going to talk about basically what's going to be the last topic of the year. Uh, and these are something new that you have not seen yet that are called polar coordinates and polar functions. Uh, so what this is going to be, we're going to start off with how to convert the normal xy coordinate to a polar coordinate, what, what we call r comma theta. Uh, we'll talk about what, kind of what that means, and we're going to talk about some common polar curves and what they look like and kind of how to graph and stuff like this. So as always, good idea to have something to write on and write with. Um, and also, as you're doing some of the conversions, um, a calculator is helpful. It's not necessary, but if, even if you can use Desmos or something like that, it would be a good idea uh, to have access to something like that. Okay. So uh, before we get started, a little little moment of uh, of humor. Um, so I, I found these these two little memes here about uh, polar coordinates. So I'm sure the person you thought of when, when you thought of a polar coordinate was like an igloo or up in the North Pole, something like that. That's not quite what we're talking about, um, but it is kind of funny to think about that. And then this. So technically, this is not a polar equation, unfortunately. Uh, however, if you graph that equation, you will see a very nice looking heart. And there is a way to graph a heart in polar coordinates also. So we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll see a little bit about that towards the end of the video. Okay. So now, first of all, we're going to talk about polar coordinates and how can we convert those things. Well, let's go back a couple of years. You know, you've been graphing x, y forever. You know, you, if I give you the point 2, comma 5 or whatever, you know how to graph that, right? Uh, you know that x is it was the horizontal distance. You go left, right, the x. You go up and down the y, and that's your point, right? But there's another way, and this other way is what we call r comma theta, okay? And I'm going to bring up a picture here. So you see the point x y is, is, is at the end here, right? That's our point x y. Well, the r is just the distance from the origin, and in, in this case, what we call the origin is actually we call the pole, kind of the North Pole. So that distance, that point is away, we call that the R distance, okay? And then the angle from the x-axis, what we call the polar axis, is gonna be our, is gonna be our theta. And remember, theta is just a Greek letter, just a var variable, just like any, anything else, like an X or Y or whatever. Excuse me. Okay, now let's say we're given the vertex, our normal x, y coordinate. How can we find the polar coordinate on theta? Well, go back to what we just did with vectors the last couple of weeks. We know how to find the magnitude because that's all that r is. So to find r, you just do the Pythagorean theorem, just like you did before. And to find that angle theta, that's the direction angle of a vector. Okay, so polar equations and polar coordinates and vectors are very closely related to each other. Okay, so you should know those formulas from the last couple of weeks, but we're going to use that now to convert individual points to a polar coordinate. Okay, now as always, whenever you find that theta, you got to you got to kind of be mind be mindful of what quadrant our point is in. Okay, so we do some examples. I'll put the formulas up there. You might want to drop those down if you don't know them already. So we're going to start with a rectangle and go to pole. All right, so we've got 12 pi. So how would I find the R, that mean theorem? And simplify this. In this case, 169, the square root of 169 is clean because that's 13, so that's fine. And then for the theta, remember it's always y over x. Put that in the calculator, make sure you're in degrees. And it's 22.62. Now, in this case, this point is in quadrant one, so that answer is all there is. So I'm going to write my polar coordinate as the r comma theta. And that's it. Okay? So let's do a couple more examples. So let's do one. So we got the point negative 3, 7. And again, find the magnitude or find that length for that new theorem. Watch your signs. Root 58. Now, I'm going to leave it like that if you want to write that as a decimal that's okay but i'm just going to leave it as a square root find the theta 
put that in the calculator. And remember, this point is in quadrant two, so we need to add 180 to that answer to get 113.2, and then that's going to be my core coordinate there. Okay. So here's another one. So negative six, negative four. Go and do this by yourself. Pause the video real fast to see if you can find the polar coordinate on this one on your own. And we'll zip through the answer in a couple seconds. So now we got R is root 52. Again, watch those signs. Those are always going to be positive numbers. And the inverse tangent. And again, this is in quadrant three. So we need to add 180 again to the calculator answer. So there's that polar coordinate. And the last one, and again, if I try to, to do this last one too, I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can do that by yourself. So we find the R, and again, always positive. I believe that is the square root of 130, 121 plus 9. And then for the theta, inverse tangent, y over x. And again, this is in quadrant four. So how much, so what do we have to add in quadrant four from a couple weeks ago? Well, we've got to add 360 to that number. So there's my whole coordinate. Okay. So let's go in rectangular to polar. Well, what if we go the other direction? What if we start with polar with a polar coordinate and we want to convert it back to an xy? Well, let's bring up that picture again. And how could I find, if I know R and the angle, can you think of a way that I could find the X and Y? Well, this goes back to our old friend Sokotoa from the beginning of the semester. Okay, so <clears throat> we can see it's pretty easy to work out that X is equal to R times the cosine of theta, and Y is equal to R times the sine of theta. Okay? Now, you do have to remember, you might be given theta in degrees or radians. So as you're doing a problem, make sure that you're in, in the correct mode. Uh, so, but let's do a couple of examples with these. So we're going to start with r theta. We want to get the x, y. So first one, 5 comma 60 degrees. So again, let's use that formula, same formula every single time. The x is 5 cosine, cosine of 60. And the y is 5 sine of 60. Pop that in the calculator. And you get the point 2.5 comma 4.33. How about this one? 3 comma 193 degrees. Same formula. Never changes. 3 cos 193 and 3 sine 193. Pop those in the calculator. And you get the coordinate negative 2.92 common negative 6, 0.67. So that's actually going to be quadrant 3, which, by the way, makes sense because my angle here is in quadrant 3. So they're going to match up with that, right? See one more example. So in this case, notice my theta in this case, anytime you see a pi right here or if you do not see a degree symbol, that's showing you're in radians. So if you're using a calculator, make sure you're switching it back to radians if you don't see that degree symbol. But it's the same formula. And in this case, they actually come out to be the same numbers, just different signs, because they're in quadrant four. Okay? So that's all I got to know about polar coordinates as far as converting back and forth. Okay? And again, if you need to go back and write those formulas down uh, for converting one, one to the other, Make sure and do that because that's going to be part of the assignment this week. What about polar curves? So we can graph functions just like we would graph a function on an xy plane, but these are going to look a little bit different. Okay, so a polar grid, um, the easiest way to do a polar grid is to actually do something that looks like this, almost like a spider web. But notice what happens here is each circle on that is going to be a radius of one or a distance of one unit from the pole. So this little tiny circle in here would be, that's all one unit away. The second one's all two units away and so on and so forth. So it makes it easier to do a distance out here. And then each line is an angle at a certain angle theta. And of course, this is still angle zero right here, the positive x-axis. 
and then it kind of goes up from there. Now, usually we're going to mark these angles off in radians. You can do degrees also, but traditionally it's in radians. And it's usually in multiples of pi over 12, which is 15 degrees. Okay, so I, there, there's what the first, uh, the first quadrant looked like. And again, if, in degrees, it'd be 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. And then that same kind of pattern all the way around. So if you had a function, and again, I'm not going to make you guys do this, because it's kind of hard in the distance learning environment to, to really be successful in doing this. Uh, but generally what you do is if you had a function of r equals whatever, you're going to make a table of values for that given function for the given input values. And so you begin, so you're going to input the angle and it's going to output the r or the distance. And then you're just going to plot the points as normal. Okay. And a lot of times, you know, the r may not be a clean number, so you have to kind of go between lines or whatever, but that's, that's okay. Okay, but again, I'm not going to have you guys do that. This is more recognizing certain properties of certain graphs. Okay, we're going to get into that. Okay, so these these curves, these functions, and they are functions, even though they're not going to look like it when you, when you see a graph in just a minute. Uh, some of these things have have certain names and certain properties. So we're going to start with what's called a raised curve, and we're going to see why it's called that in just a second. So it's going to be in this kind of format. R equals A times cosine of B theta, or R equals A times sine of B theta. Okay, sine or cosine, same format. It's just got to kind of change uh, some symmetry issues and stuff like that. So what this is going to be, uh, A, that number in front, is going to be the number of petals. I'm sorry, it's going to be the radius of the petals. A is going to be the radius, it's going to be how long the petals are, basically. And then B is going to be two cases. So if B is an odd number, like three, five, seven, so on and so forth, then there's going to be that many petals. And if B is an even number, two, four, six, eight, then there's going to be two times the number of petals. I'm going to show you a demonstration on Desmos. Uh, the big, the only difference between the sine and the cosine are sine curves are always going to be symmetric about the y-axis, and then cosine curves are going to be symmetric about the x-axis. So let me show you a couple of these things real fast. I'm going to bring Desmos up here. So I've got a setup for a sine rose curve, and I got some sliders here, and I'm going to post the link to this uh, demonstration, and I'll. I'll Put the link down in the description and I'll also put it up on Google Classroom where you can change the different A values and the B values. Okay, so here I've got the A is three, and you can see the distance from here down to here that is three. It's the same distance from the pole after that max distance here. You see that, that circle right here is at three, same thing out to here. Okay, but notice let's change the A first. So as A gets bigger, so there's four, there's five, there's six. And I can make it smaller too. I can make it down to one if I want to. Okay, nothing else changes. It's just kind of the size of the thing. But now look at the B. So here I have B is three. And remember what I said a second ago, remember if B is odd, it's got that number of petals. So in this case, B is three, so there's three petals. Well, what if I take it back to two? Well, if I've already got two petals, look at there. Now I've got four petals. Same deal. If I go up to four, where B is four, look at how many petals there are. There's eight of them. Five, odd number, five petals. And then six would be 12. And you can keep on going. I, I have the slider stopped at six because if you get too many more than that, they all get kind of scrunched together. It's even kind of hard to count. So, but again, I'll put the link to this up on the... Uh, down in the description below there. Okay, and also notice again, this is the sine function, so it's symmetric about the x. I'm sorry, it's symmetric about the y axis. That's it in half. But look, if I change this to cosine, so here's the cosine here now. And again, notice the a is still the same, and I can make it bigger or I can make it smaller or whatever. And the number of petals changes the same way. So if B is even, there's four petals, odd, even, odd, 
either. Okay, and notice this is always symmetric about the x axis. Okay, so again, those are called rose curves. So let me bring this guy back up here. And what we're going to do is what I want you to be able to do basically here is be able to identify, even without graphing it yourself, and again, you can use Desmos or whatever, but we should be able to see an equation like this, r equals 3 cosine 3 theta, and be able to say, okay, what's the radius, how many petals are there, and what kind of symmetry is there going to be? Okay, so let's go one by one. So we know that first number is our radius, so we can have a radius of 3. We know the second number is that B, that inside, so we may have three petals. I kind of wrote those backwards, sorry about that. And then it's a cosine, so it's going to be symmetric about the x axis. If you can do that, that's all I want you to be able to do with these. Okay, and then kind of be able to match graphs if you see pictures of How about this guy here? So five sine of two theta. So how many petals are we going to have, first of all? I mean, the petals is the inside number. That's an even number, so you multiply by two. So it's four petals. The radius is the outside number. And it's a sine, so it's going to be symmetric by the y axis. One more. How about cosine of six theta? How many petals would that have? So it's going to have 12. What would the radius of this be? Well, notice there's not a number that's written in front, but we know from a long, long time ago, if you don't see a number, the number that's actually there is 1. So the radius is just going to be 1, a little tiny flower. And of course, it's a cosine, so it's still symmetric about the x axis. Okay, so that's what you got to know about rose curves. There's another family of curves. They actually have different names, but they're really the same kind of format equation wise. So these are called limosomes and cardoids. Okay, and that little C here, it's a French word. Um, so, but, they, but they're in the same format. And the format is this. Notice uh, the A and the B now, the B is in front of the cosine or the sine, and the A is as you're being added or subtracted out front. Okay, the theta inside of here is just a plain old theta for these kind of curves. Okay, and here notice the A and the B can be positive or negative. For the rose curves, they can still be positive, but doesn't really, or negative, but doesn't change a whole lot. But these, the negative definitely changes kind of what direction it goes. Like that. We'll see that in just one second. So lemosomes happen when that first number is less than the coefficient. Okay, so if the first number is less than the coefficient, then we have something called a lemosome, and we'll see what that looks like in just one second. Uh, but it's going to have two loops. So it's going to have an outer loop and an inner loop. Okay, if you add those two numbers, whatever they are, don't worry about the signs. If you add those two numbers, that's going to be the length of the outer loop. And if you subtract the two numbers, it's going to be the length of the inner loop. And, so, and again, you'll see what I'm going to show you what those look like in just one second. Just like rose curves, the sine are symmetric about the y axis and the cosine is symmetric about the x axis. And then the other family that kind of relates these same kind of formats are called cardinals. Okay, and that's when a is greater than or equal to b. Okay. There's two cases here. So when a is equal to b is what we call dimple and dim. I'm going to show you what that looks like in just one second. But if a is uh, if, if A is greater than B, it's not dimple. And you're just going to see a little, well, you'll see in this one. The thing to remember with this family is the A plus B is still going to be the maximum length of the curve. So it's still, it's still the same kind of thing with the lean zone. Uh, it's still going to be that maximum length. Okay? And of course, the same symmetry as everything else. So let's take a look and see what these guys look like. I'll take my rose curve off. So I'll start off with the sine function. So notice here, my A and my B are the same thing. And that's where the dimple happens. Okay, that's, that's, that should be a cardioid dimple. But watch what happens. I'm actually going to make A a little bit smaller. I'm going to make A equal 1. And look here, this is what we call a lemosome. 
because now my A is less than B, and you can see those two loops that we have. And in this case here, so if I make that a little smaller, so you see my first loop is, is one, two minus one, and my outer loop is actually three, two plus one. And I can change B if I get make, make B bigger. Let's say B is equal to five. Notice now my inner loop is four, because it's five minus one, and my outer loop is six, five plus one. And I can change that up here if I make this up into four, Kind of goes off the screen here, but look, my inner loop is one, and my outer loop would go all the way up here to nine, kind of up here off the screen. Okay, and notice I can also make these things negative. So if I'll, I'll, I'll keep that there at three, but let's say we make B negative. Okay, notice it's the same thing. Five minus three is two, that's still the distance of that inner loop. 5 plus 3 is 8, and you see it goes off the screen down to 8. But you see it's kind of upside down now, okay? So it works the same way. So you're still taking just kind of the absolute value of those guys and go to go from there. And whether it's sine or cosine, notice the sine is symmetric about the y-axis, but if I bring up the cosine graph, that's going to be symmetric about the x-axis. It works the same way. There's your, there's your levosome. There's your inner loop, there's your dimple, and then there's this is also a cardoid that you see as A and B get as A gets bigger and bigger, that's what gets kind of closer to almost a circle. Not quite a circle, but getting close to it. Okay. And you can and again, I'm gonna post a link to this so you can kind of post you, you can play around with these sliders and, and do some things like that. Okay. So again, what I'm going to ask you to do is just kind of identify um, some properties of lean and particles. Okay, and again, using exactly what this is here. So you've got one plus four cosine theta. So notice a less than b. So this is going to be a lean The outer loop is going to be five, four plus one. The inner loop is three, four minus one, and it'll be symmetric by the x-axis of the cosine. How about this guy? Three plus three sine theta. Now that's going to be a cardoid, and it's going to be dimpled because that three plus that three and three is the same number. That's where you have that little dimple in there. The max length is going to be six, and it's going to be symmetric about the y-axis. So probably that's what I'm doing. How about two plus three sine theta? What kind of would that be? Now, again, this is not a lemosome because the first number is less than the second number. So the outer loop here would be 5, and the loop is 1, 3 minus 2. I'm not sure about the y axis. And we'll do one more. 4 minus 3 cosine theta, what kind of that be? So it's going to be a cardoid if A is greater than B. No, this is not dimpled in this case. It's just a regular cardinal. Mass length is going to be seven. Again, don't worry about the sign. You're just worried about the coefficients and those, those numbers. So four plus three is seven. That's your mass length. And it'll be symmetric by the x axis. Okay. Now, I do have a couple other. The only ones I'm going to, I'm going to really ask you about are the rose curves, the lemosomes, and the cardinals. But I do have a couple of other interesting curves that I want to show you. Uh, on Desmos, just because they're kind of cool. So the first one is what's called the spiral of Archimedes. If you just graph a function of r equals theta, it's going to start here and kind of swerve around. And if I zoomed out, you can see this great big just spiral that keeps on going bigger and bigger and bigger. So well, that's kind of cool. So you can Google that again. It's called the spiral of Archimedes. And another one is called a lemniscate. It's actually called the uh, Bernoulli's Lemniscate because he's the guy that kind of figured it out. Uh, and you see the, the you see the equation here. It's kind of a, a more complicated equation, but it looks like this, kind of like an infinity symbol. And in fact, I can change the size of the infinity symbols. So I can make it all tiny, or I can make it big, or what have you. So that's called a 
and called Bernoulli's Lemniscate. And I'll, and I'll put those names down in the description if you want to Google them and kind of try to remember those tests. So th those are also going to be on the same test notes. Okay. So that is pretty much it. That's everything I want to talk about with uh, with polar curves and um, and of course uh, converting points from rectangular to polar and back and forth. So um, I'm going to end here with just a couple pictures of those graphs. If you have uh, you have any questions, you get feel free to go back to the video, take some notes if you need to on those different properties. Uh, there is going to be an assignment posted on classroom for this week based on converting points and just kind of identifying some of some of those properties of the characters. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, feel free, if you have anybody else that's in pre-cal that's doing poll recorders at the same time, feel free to share the video with them. Um, stay well, stay healthy. I miss you guys. Um, and we will see you guys in the next video. Until then, keep studying.